them on down. Send them on down. Oh, and let the Holy Ghost come on down. Send them on down. Send them on down. Oh, and let the Holy Ghost come on down. Send them on down. Send them on down. Oh, and let the Holy Ghost come on down. Send them on down. Praise the Lord this morning. Good to be here this morning at Matthew's uh, Church of God. Amen. The blood that Jesus Would you help sing? 
singing this morning. We're glad to have Mark and Crystal Lowry with us today. 
Uh, Crystal is my wife's second cousin, all the way from Lumberton, Pembroke area. We're glad to have them with us in service. And the folks that came with them are going to be doing a little drama. Amen. Let them know you appreciate them coming. Amen. It's also good to have home with us all the way from San Diego, California, our resident Navy man, David Robertson. Amen. We're glad to have him home with us today. Amen. I asked him where he parked his yellow submarine. He's a sub man, and we're glad that he's with us today. Good to have Sophie with us as well. We appreciate your coming to be with us in service, and it's good to see all of you here today. I wonder, do we have any first-time visitors in service? Would you lift up your hand, please? Anyone here for the very first time? Folks over here? Anyone else? Any returning visitors? We're glad to have you. Amen. We appreciate your coming right here. God bless you. Would you let them know you appreciate them coming today? Praise God. Amen. I want to remind you that we do have service tonight at 6.30. You don't want to miss tonight's service. And then on Wednesday night, back here for the midweek service, we have a great time on Wednesday nights. Thursday is going to be the kickoff of the annual women's barbecue sale. They're going to be working starting around 4 o'clock on uh, Thursday evening. If you can come out and help them, Brother Bobby Hunt has already got the little piggy from the market, and he's going to be ready to cook that up, some good old barbecue. Uh, like he has been doing the last several years. I don't know how many years this makes, but uh, he has been working hard and, and uh, getting some folks to help him as well. And uh, Friday is the day, big day, starting at 11 o'clock from 11 to 2 uh, for barbecue. And usually we have some left over. A lot of people like to buy it in bulk, and they'll have that available for you as well, possibly by next Sunday too, if you can't get it on Friday or Saturday. This coming, uh, this afternoon around uh, 6.15, I believe it is, there, those of you that are involved in the King is Coming program, you need to meet in the conference room at 6.15. So if you're in that program, don't miss out. Don't uh, uh, fail to be here for that special meeting. I'm going to ask you if you will to stand as we get ready to go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray that God would move in a special way in this service. I believe the Lord it wants to speak to us today. I believe that he has something he wants to stir us up with and I believe if we'll allow him to he will help us today I don't know about you but I need a blessing I need to get closer to him and I'm praying that he'll move in a great mighty way in this service let us pray together father we thank you for the privilege we have today to come together in your house to worship you we welcome your presence in this place we welcome the manifestation of your spirit we ask you to move upon every heart and every soul let there be revival. Let there be renewal and refreshing. We know, Lord, that you're able to change and turn around those that have gone astray, that they'll return to you, that you might return to them. We ask you to move upon the lost. Lord, convict their hearts that they cannot rest until they seek your face to be saved. We ask you, Lord, to touch the sick and the hurting and the suffering. We know that with your stripes we are healed. We ask you, Lord, for your divine intervention this day. We'll be careful to praise you and give you glory. For all these things, for it's in the lovely name and holy name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Would you take a moment, welcome one another to the Matthews Church of God. We're delighted to have you in service today.
as the ushers come. Let's go to the Lord with our tithes and offerings. This is not what I had prepared for offertory this morning, but just before coming up here, the Lord placed this on my heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Do we ever stop to think what that really means? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I'm an only child, right? Dad just died. I'm an only child. I could never imagine him sending me to die for one of the neighbors or for somebody down the street. But yet our Heavenly Father sent his one and only son to die for each and every one of us. And to me, that is profound. That is deep. Why would I refuse to do the simple things that he asked of me? Why would I hold back any good thing that he first gave to me? When we give in our tithes and offerings, we just give back a small portion to what he first gave to us, what he's blessed us with already. And it is such an honor and such a privilege to give to his kingdom here on this earth. Let's go to the Lord with our tithes and offerings. Let's pray. Almighty, gracious, heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much, Lord, for the wonderful opportunity to be in your house once again, Lord. Father, I worship and praise your holy name, Lord, because of who you are, Lord. You're the Alpha and the Omega, the creator of the heavens and the earth, Lord. Father, you're the provider of everything that we need. You even provide some of what we want, Lord. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, I praise you for the greatest gift that you've ever given to mankind, Lord. That is salvation that only comes by the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That precious blood that we just sang about, Lord. Father, I praise you for that precious blood. And I hope that blood flows freely in this service today, Lord. Touch each and every person in the congregation. Touch the man of God as he brings the message. Touch each and every hand represented in the plates, Lord. Take the monies that we collect. Use it for the furtherance of your kingdom here on this earth. And I'll be careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, all the glory. In Jesus' name, I praise you. Amen. Break every chain. 
stars You're bigger than the things oh, That could tear me apart You're bigger than the universe You're bigger than the sun and the stars You're bigger than the things Oh my, oh my That could tear me apart
Let's worship the Lord. Do what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He said, me. Well, just in time, oh, I'm gonna praise His name. He said it's just the same. Come on and praise Him. Look what the Lord has done. Well, look what the Lord has done. Well, look what the Lord has done. My body, he touched my mind. He said, Me just in time. Oh, I'm gonna praise his name. He said, It's just the same. Come on and praise him. Look what the Lord has done. Yeah, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me just in time. Oh, I'm going to praise His name. He said He's just the same. Come on and praise Him. Look what the Lord has done. done something for you today praise him if you have He's done something for you all week you need to be praising him right now hallelujah what the Lord has done. Well, look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me just in time. Oh, I'm going to praise His name. He said it's just the same. Come on and praise Look what the Lord has done. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Freedom reigns here at Matthews. Amen. I felt so at home here this morning when I entered those doors. Would you help us sing Freedom Reigns in this place? Praise God. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Lift your eyes to heaven. There is freedom. Oh, lift your eyes to heaven. There is freedom. Well, freedom reigns, freedom reigns in this place. There are
ought to give. We ought to give it all to Jesus. Hallelujah. There is freedom. Oh. of the Lord. I appreciate his spirit in this service today. It's so good to come to church and to feel God. To go to church and to have fellowship with the saints, to be able to enjoy singing together and worshiping together. And just because it's time for preaching doesn't mean we stop working together. When Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost, the 11 stood up with him. They helped him. So I hope you'll help me this morning. I did want to say something about, uh, I appreciate our visitors with us today again. The Lowry's, thank you so much for coming. And these young girls doing the drama, we appreciate them coming all the way from Robson County. I'm kind of partial to Lumbees for some reason. But uh, we're delighted to have them. And why can't they sing? And can't they bless us? But I want to mention too that we have a birthday girl in the house over here on the organ. Sister Phoebe's birthday. Amen. Is she still looking good? Still playing good? And her son, Jerry, is with us today in service. Her sister, Wanda, I got that right? And her friend with us, what's her name again? Rose Marie. Good to have you with us today in service to help celebrate your mom's birthday. She's a special lady. We love her and we appreciate all that she does in the church. Amen. Just remain standing for the reading of the word. I want to read to you from the book of Acts. Probably one of my favorite books in the New Testament. Acts chapter 20, beginning with verse 7 and reading through verse 12. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech unto midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep, and as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and had eaten and talked a long while, even till the break of day, so he departed, and they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. I want to begin a message this morning, and I hope to conclude it tonight, on a young man named Eutychus. 
Would you pray with me and ask God's anointing today? Father, we thank you for this blessed privilege that we have to gather together in your house and in your name. Lord, we have prepared our hearts. We've stayed in your presence to learn what you would have us to say. I pray, God, now for the unction, the anointing, the divine enablement of your spirit to be able to preach and proclaim the truths of the word. I pray, Lord, that you would touch every ear to be receptive to the word today and that it would sink into our hearts. We would be challenged by your holy word. I pray, God, that you would touch especially our young people today. That they would see a light they would see the way to go, that they would hear your voice, that they would follow in the steps you would have them to take. I pray, Lord, that you would arrest our attention, that our hearts and minds be stayed upon you. We welcome you, Holy Ghost, to move and manifest in this place. Father, we'll give you glory and praise and honor for all things you do, for it's in the lovely name of Jesus Christ we pray and ask it all. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Eutychus is a very unusual name. In fact, I don't know anyone who is named Eutychus. But the literal meaning of the name Eutychus is lucky. Years ago on the Tonight Show, Johnny Carson read an item from the lost and found column in a Midwestern newspaper. It read, lost dog, brown fur, some missing due to mange, Blind in one eye, deaf, lame leg due to recent traffic accident, slightly arthritic, goes by the name of Lucky. But Eutychus was not as lucky as that dog because the Bible says that he fell out of a three-story window to his death. Just this past week, I read the the sad story of a 22-year-old young man who fell to his death out of a balcony, off of a balcony at a hotel in Myrtle Beach. He had been staying at the hotel with his mother. His mother had taken a nap and he had gone out on the balcony to take pictures and somehow fell to his death. It was Sunday and Eutychus was on the third floor of the building where they were having church. The house was packed. In fact, all three stories were filled with people. They had come to hear this most sought after preacher in the territory by the name of Apostle Paul. He was in the pulpit and everyone wanted to hear him preach because when he preached, he preached in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. Not only that, he spoke with tongues more than anyone else. So he was spirit-filled. He was anointed of the Holy Ghost. And on this night, the Bible said that he had been preaching for a long time. And this young man named Eutychus fell into a deep sleep. He then fell out of the window into the street, much like King Isaiah had happened in 2 Kings chapter 1 says, and King and, and Hazziah the king fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick, so he died. He fell out of the window. This young man named Eutychus fell out of the window. Twice it mentions that he was a young man, so the Spirit of God wants us to understand that this was a young man who literally fell out of church. The fact is our young people are falling out of church. According to a survey conducted by Lifeway Research, 66% of Americans between 23 and 30 years old said they stopped attending church on a regular basis for at least a year after turning 18. It usually starts with a transition of going off to college or moving away from home or of getting a job. College students are a rare sight 
on Sunday mornings. Once they reach the 20 years of age, once they reach into their 20s, statistics tell us that only one in three continue to go to church on a regular basis. We just recently had to close down and sell the properties of two of our churches that are in college area, in an area filled with college students, but they will not go to church. So this survey gives the top five reasons why young people fall out of church. Number one, 34% said it happened when they moved away to college and they could no longer attend their local church. What happens is that many times they get their freedom, they're away from mom and dad and they can do as they please. There are no curfews, there are no restrictions, there's no parent to ask them where you've been, who you've been with, why were you out so late, no one to, to follow up after them, so they just kind of do as they please. But Isaiah 51 and 1 says, Hearken unto me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock whence ye were hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. In other words, don't forget where you've come from. Don't forget your heritage. Don't forget your roots. Don't forget where mom and dad have brought you from. He says in Job 24 and 2, some remove the landmarks. It's a dangerous thing to move the landmarks. It's a dangerous thing to move the boundaries. They're there for a purpose. There's a reason why they are there. You, you still need the church and you still need God. No matter where you go, no matter where you are, you need God. You need his presence. You need his direction. You need his word. Number two, 32% said because church members seem judgmental or hypocritical. It doesn't take long for these bright young people to be able to figure out that everybody that claims to be a Christian is not a Christian. They can see through the hypocrisy. They can see the hidden genders. They can see the hidden motives. And I thought about this the other day. You know, if, if you profess to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, if you profess to have the fullness of the Spirit and people that know you have to ask you if you have the Holy Ghost, then something is wrong. If people can't tell that you're full of the Spirit, then something is wrong. The Holy Ghost is going to be evident in the life of a believer. He's going to be evident. The initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost is speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. But that's not the only evidence. There's so many other evidences that you have the Spirit of God in you. There's a lot of fruit that are evidence of the Spirit of God. The evidence of love is going to be there. You cannot backbite and backstab and gossip all week long and then come to church and act like you're spiritual. You cannot do that because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost constrains us. The Holy Ghost keeps us in check. The Holy Ghost helps us to hold our tongue. The love of God in this, Jesus said, men will know that you are my disciples in that you have love one for another. There's going to be the evidence of love. He that loveth not knoweth not God for God he is a love. Doesn't matter how much we claim to have. Doesn't matter how spiritual we want people to think we are. Love is the foundation. Love is the first thing that people will take notice of. It's a fruit of the spirit to have the love of God in our hearts and in our lives. The second evidence of the fruit is joy. Joy. There's something wrong when we claim to have the Spirit of God, the fullness of the Spirit, and act like an old sourpuss all the time. Something's wrong. There was a young girl who, uh, who, uh, who became a Christian. She went to her local church to revival, and she got saved. The next Sunday, she joined the church and got baptized in water. That afternoon, she went skipping through the house, singing and dancing before the Lord. Her old sourpuss grandfather rebuked her. 
And he said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You just joined the church and here you are singing and dancing on the Lord's day. Well, he crushed that little girl, just broke her heart. She went outside with tears in her eyes, went down to the barn, climbed upon the fence, and she noticed the old mule that was there with with the floppy ears and the long face and the blurry eyes. She reached over sympathetically and patted him on the head and said, don't cry, old mule. You must have the same kind of religion that Grandpa has. When you've got the spirit, you're going to have joy. There's going to be joy in your life. He said in Acts 13, 52, and the disciple was filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. There should be some joy in the life of a believer. There should be joy in the heart of a spirit-filled individual. The evidence of peace. The fruit of peace is not only peace with God, it's living with peace and it's living in peace and not coming all to pieces because he's Jehovah Shalom. He is our peace speaker. He speaks peace into us. He gives us peace that passes all understanding. There's the fruit of long suffering. We can be so hard on each other. We can make demands of others and we can have expectations of others that we don't even have for ourselves. What happened to being patient with others? What happened to being long-suffering? What happened to being merciful? I don't know about you, but I believe the word of God that if you want to have mercy, you better show mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I need all the mercy I can get from God and I'm glad that every day his mercy is new. I'm thankful thankful for the mercy that he has shown to me that saved a wretch like me. Hallelujah. Then there's the evidence of gentleness. The Holy Ghost produces sweetness in our souls. When we start getting rough and harsh with each other, we're in desperate need of a refilling of the Spirit of God. We're running low. We're we're running out. We're, We're losing out because the Spirit of God will cause us to have a gentleness of soul. There's the evidence of goodness. Goodness is doing the right thing for the right reason. Goodness is is what causes us to be gracious. It causes us to be kind and courteous and to be polite. I'm old fashioned, I still believe in chivalry and and I I refuse to stop being that way even though I may say excuse me or pardon me or whatever and may not get a response. There's some folks that will not uh, respond to anything you say but I'm not gonna stop saying it. I'm not gonna stop being polite because somebody else is being rude because I've got the spirit of God in me and that goodness of the spirit dwells in me. The evidence of faith is going to be their faith is the result of growth. It's the the result of abiding in Christ. We live by faith and not by fear. We live by faith and not by sight. We live by faith and not by feelings. It's a fruit of the Spirit. The evidence of meekness. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is humility to where we have a teachable spirit where we esteem others more highly than ourselves, to where that we don't promote ourselves, but we promote and exalt the Lord. We lift him up. We brag on him. We boast about the Lord. We glory in the cross of Jesus Christ. We exalt his name because his name is above all other names. Then the evidence of temperance, self-restraint, self-control, self-denial. There's a lot of people that blame the devil on their sins and on their problems. Did you know the devil can't make you do anything that you don't want to do? He's given us this fruit of temperance. The Spirit of God gives us the ability and the power to resist the devil and he'll flee from us. I don't care what Flip Wilson used to say, the devil cannot make you do it. If he could, he'd make everybody sin. He'd make everybody go astray. But he doesn't have that power because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You can live right. You can live holy. You can deny the flesh and the devil in the world. Hallelujah. And live holy and godly in Christ Jesus. It's time we practiced what we preached. It's time we walk what we talk. 
Because if we don't, we're going to lose the next generation. Nothing turns people off worse than hypocrisy. The third reason they give is that they no longer feel connected to the people in the church. No longer connected. Some people never get connected and some don't stay connected for very long. Little Jack Horner sat in the corner. He thought he was being a good boy. But you know, if we don't reach out to one another, if we don't encourage one another, then we're missing what it's all about. It's time we hold each other up to encourage one another, to exhort one another. That's what the Bible said to do. Don't sit off in a corner and say, I want you to bless me, Lord. I want you to do for me, Lord. It's not all about you. It's about him. It's about ministry. It's about helping others, encouraging others. Take somebody by the hand and say, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to talk with you because we want to make it to heaven together. According to those who do these kind of studies, they say within the first seven minutes of a visitor coming to church, they decide if they're going to come back or not. That's before the first song is sung. That's before the first word of the message is preached. They've already made a decision whether or not they're going to come back to church or not. Because the first things they see, the first things that they absorb, the first things that they take in are the building. They, they, want, they want to look at the building. Several years ago, we had a, a fellow in the district, and, and uh, I went over to his church, and it was just falling to pieces. I mean, it was nasty, filthy, dusty. The grass was over a foot high. And he wanted to tell me, well, we just don't have any money. I said, brother, water and soap goes a long way. If you can't get somebody to cut it, you cut it. That becomes your responsibility. Don't let the house of God fall apart. Don't go home and have an immaculate yard in your own home. Don't go home and have a nice home to live in and you let the house of God fall in disrepair. It's time we take notice that this is God's house and God's property. People take notice of the building, of the landscaping, of the parking lot, of the church sign, the interest area, the, the lobby, the bulletin and the friendliness of the greeters and of the people. They take notice of that. That's the first thing that they'll notice, and they've already decided after seven minutes whether or not they're going to come back. We do our best around here to take care of the property. We do our best to make sure it's cleaned and smelling fresh, but there's not a whole lot you can do about people's rotten attitudes. When somebody's got a rotten attitude, they're hard to deal with. It doesn't cost a dime to be friendly. It doesn't cost a dime to be nice. It doesn't take a whole lot of effort just to kind of go out of your way to make somebody welcome, to make them feel like that, that you want them there. You know, a lot of people look around and say, what are you doing here? I wonder where they came from. I wonder who that, I wonder if they're out to get my job. I wonder if they want my position in the church. I wonder if they'll get on the singing program and I won't get to sing as much. I wonder what they're doing here instead of going, it's so good to have somebody to join up with us, to get involved with us. We need more singers. We need more teachers. We need more prayers. We need more workers. We need more laborers. Come on in. Join the family of God. Get connected. Get plugged in. 25, number four, 25% said the reason they fall out of church is because they disagree with the political and social issues of the church. My question is, when did we get away from the gospel? God hasn't called us to be politicians. He's called us to be preachers. But these days, people come to church. They hear more about uh, they hear more about Pelosi and Schumer than they do about Paul and Silas. They hear more about politics than they do the prophets. They hear more about guns than they do about the gospel. It's time we got back to preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation. You can't go wrong with preaching the gospel. It covers every area. It covers every area of society. You don't have to get on a hobby horse to get your viewpoint across. You just preach the word in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exalt with long suffering and doctrine because it will not return void. Somebody ought to say amen. Number five, 24% fall out of church 
because they work on Sunday. Sunday has become just another work day, just another fun day. I want to tell you this is a spiritual decision. It's a spiritual decision. I know we can make all the excuses we want, but that is a spiritual decision. Doesn't the Bible say, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you? Didn't Jesus say, what will it profit you if you gain the whole world and then lose your soul? We have a real problem trying to fill up a church that holds about 400 people. But you know, Panther Stadium holds over 75,000 people. Knight Stadium holds over 10,000 people. They don't have any problem getting people there any day of the week, especially on Sunday. They'll be there if it's 100 degrees or if it's freezing cold. They'll be there in the rain, the sleet, the snow. They'll go there because you do what's important to you. You go where you want to go. But as for me and my house, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. I've got to get to church. I've got to get in the presence of God. I've got to get a hold of the gospel of Christ so I can fight the devil all week long. I'm not going to get it from a panther cheer. I'm not going to get it from a baseball. I'm going to get it on my knees before God. He's going to fill me and fall with his power and his presence and his anointing. <laughs> lovely, lovely young people used to sit on these same pews you're sitting on today. Lovely young people, loved those young people, but they fell out of church. Young people who I've seen shed tears. Young people that I've seen get up here and do drama. Young people that got up here and sang in the youth choir. Young people, but they fell out of church. They're now living in sin and they're not ashamed to post it on social media. Young people committing fornication. Young people drinking. Young people smoking pot. Young people who are addicted to drugs and pornography and who knows what else. This is a generation that we don't know what to do with. A generation that's vaping, throwing water on policemen, disrespecting anybody in authority, including their own parents. Parents who won't correct them, parents who won't discipline them because they want to be their buddy and their pal and their friend instead of being their parents. The school can't do anything with them. The police can't do anything with them. The church can't do anything with them. And the parents can't do anything with them. We're in serious trouble. We're about to lose a generation. The devil is about to snatch them out from under us. It's time for the church to be the church and to rise up and stand on the word of God and say, devil, you're not getting my son. You're not getting my daughter. Eutychus fell out of church. You can remove the name Eutychus and you can fill in the blank with just about any name of somebody who's fallen out of church. Mark 10, 13 says, and they brought young children to him, to Jesus, that he should touch them. And the disciples rebuked those that brought them. But notice that first part. They brought, parents brought their children to Jesus, said, Lord, would you touch my child? Would you touch them? Would you help them? Because as parents, you know the evil that's out there. You know what, they're, they're, they're going into the den of lions. They're going into a world that's filthy and vulgar and ego, evil. You've seen so much destruction. You say, oh Lord, would you touch them? Would you put your hand upon them? Have they sought out Jesus to touch their children? The greatest thing you can do for your children is to bring them to the house of God. Get them under the influence of the gospel. Get them to feel the presence of God. Nothing will change them like the touch of the master's hand. That's far more important than being the best football player, soccer player, cheerleader, baseball player. If we can get them to fall in love with Jesus, they won't be falling out of church. 
Get them to fall in love with Jesus. Instead of using their thumbs to play video games, they'll use their thumbs to thumb through the word of God and to hear what the Lord is saying to them. They'll hide the word in their heart that they'll not sin against him. Hallelujah. Is somebody, is somebody feeling what I'm talking about this morning? We've got to get a hold of God and we've got to get our children to get a hold of God or they'll be lost for all eternity. When the playground is gone, when the trophies are all gone, the only thing that's going to matter is their relationship with God. There are many people who slam the church. I, and I know that with media being more open as it is today that we see more, I'm sure there's been a lot of stuff said in the past that didn't, didn't get reported, didn't get quoted. But I don't think I'm, I'm exaggerating when I say there is a huge anti church movement going on. I was thinking the other day, you know, there's a reason for that because there is an anti-Christ spirit in the world, many anti-Christ. So if they're anti-Christ, they're anti-church because the church is the body and the bride of Christ. So you hear them slamming the church. And when I, when I was reading this report about why young people fall out of church, I read so many comments, comment after comment, good, good for them. Best thing ever happened to them. We don't need the church. The church is full of hypocrites. We don't need it anymore. It's not necessary. It's not needful. I said, that's that antichrist spirit that wants to devour our young people. I want to stand up today and tell you, I love the church. And Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. He's the head of the church. It belongs to him. Upon this rock, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. They slam the church. They find fault with the church. There's going to come a day. You hear me this morning. There's going to come a day when they're going to wish a thousand times over that they never fell out of church. Never walked out the doors. Never walked away and said, I'm through with this. I want to cling to the cross. I want to stay on the old gospel ship. I want to hold on to the nail scarred hand of Jesus. I don't want to let go. I want to persevere. I want to pursue. I want to press in. I want to be more like Jesus every day. Oh, praise God. Some of us are getting older. I'm getting older. And you know what a lot of preachers my age are thinking? Maybe our preaching is just not appealing to young people. Well, if if it's not, then I'm in trouble because I only got one style. I don't have a bag of tricks. I'm too old to, to change horses in the middle of the stream. This is it. I'm vanilla, I'm just plain, I'm simple, don't have all the bells and whistles, just preach the word. Because when the Lord called me to preach, that's all he told me, go preach the word, go preach the word. So as we older preachers trying to reach people, we wonder if we're as outdated as the rotary telephone. Some of the young people probably don't even know what a rotary telephone is. Do we need to start using more props on the stage to get the attention. Maybe we need to set up a tent, bring a Volkswagen up here on the stage. Maybe we need to to build something up here, some kind of a little fire or something to try to hold their attention. Maybe we need to have some more high-powered music to where you have to put earplugs in unless you blow your ears out. Use a fancy PowerPoint, flashing lights, and maybe a little more action, Pastor. Need a little more action. You, you're in the pulpit. You need to, you need to get out here and, and do some aerobics and do some more uh, calisthenics and gymnastics. Do you want to kill me? Give us a little more action so you can hold our attention. You know, I, I've watched some preachers and I feel like I'm watching a tennis match. It's back and forth and back and forth. But that's them. Do we need to use alternative venues? Church is too old-fashioned. 
Maybe we need to do something outside the church and not have church. Maybe we need to be less formal, more casual. Maybe some jeans with holes in the knees. I don't want to see a preacher's knees when he's preaching. I'd rather see him on his knees praying. But when I was coming up in the church, you know, believe it or not, us older folks used to be younger folks. We used to be teenagers. And when I was coming up in the church, we didn't have a gymnasium. We didn't have computers. We didn't have PowerPoint. We didn't even have a PA system in our home church. In fact, we didn't even have padded pews. I remember when we had to slap to chairs that we sat in, little slap chairs, that was it. And the teaching tools, the, the fanciest thing we had for teaching was a flannel graph board. Does anybody know what a flannel graph board is? And Sister Garris, she would get up on youth night. She told these wonderful stories. She used these illustrated books. I can't, can't remember all of them, but they were just beautiful stories. Little Miss Bump. Anybody remember Little, little Miss Bump and, and Little Jimmy that got burned in the fire? And she'd have these wonderful stories that she would tell us every week. Well, that was, that was the extent of all the fancy modernism that we, we had. But I want to tell you something. The Spirit of God got a hold of me. The Spirit of God convicted me. And I got into an altar and I got saved without a PA system, without padded pews, without PowerPoint, without LED lighting, without smoke and mirrors. I got saved because I want to tell you the gospel is good in the church, it's good in the field, it's good in the home, it's good in the street, it's good in the prison house. You preach the gospel and it will save souls. I did not fall out of church. You know why I didn't fall out of church? I fell in love with Jesus. The best thing I ever did was when I fell in love with Jesus Christ. I didn't get filled with drugs and smoke and alcohol. I got filled with the Holy Ghost. Filled with the Holy Ghost. 16 years old, filled with the Holy Ghost. I started preaching my senior year in high school. 17 years old, didn't know the first thing about sermon outlines and hermeneutics and exegesis, didn't know anything about homiletics, didn't know anything about that. I just knew on a Saturday night in the Cornelius Church of God before a YPE service, which I was privileged to be president of, the Lord got a hold of me. Oh, he got a hold of me. I'll never forget how it was. He got a hold of me. I was praying, I was praying for the service. He got old of me. And all I know was that I felt him like I'd never felt him. And oh, I began to sing in tongues. I began to roll around on the floor. I could hear him say to me, go and preach the word. I said, Lord, is, is this you? I don't want to be in myself. I, I don't want to just think something. He said, go and preach the word. The third time he said, go and preach the word. I said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh, praise God for the call. Praise God for the anointing. Thank God for the privilege. I didn't fall out of church. I fell in love with Jesus Christ. I preached. I held two revivals my senior year in high school. I played football. My dad was so proud of my two older brothers. One was a quarterback, one was a tackle. And I always wanted to be like my brothers because I wanted my dad to be proud of me. But the Lord spoke to me before my senior year, before he even called me to preach, to not play football my senior year. I wrestled with that. I fought with that. I said, Lord, you know how you bargain with God? Lord, I just got one more year. I've already lettered in football. I've got, a, I've got a starting position. Just one more year, Lord, whatever you want me to do. But he kept, kept working on me until I said, yes, Lord. No need to fight against him. It's hard to kick against the pricks. You've got to give in to him and yield to him. I said, yes, Lord. And I thought this is going to be the hardest thing for me to do, to tell my dad I'm not going to play football. But you know, he was more proud of me being called to the ministry than I, if I'd have scored a touchdown, if I'd have won a trophy. What I want a delight to have a child who's answered the call to the ministry. Still in high school, and you know how young people are. I hear them talking about bullies. Do you know what? We had bullies back then too. Had a guy that, that uh, bullied me. In fact, he taunted me. We were on a school bus. 
we were going to a vocational school. We were taking different vocations. I was taking welding. I don't know what in the world I was thinking. I still got scars <laughs> on what I was thinking. But we went to that school. We were all boys, all boys on the school bus going to the vocational school. And this bully wanted to try to embarrass me. His name was Timothy. Timothy's not a bully name. So he changed his name to Butch, like on the Little Rascals. He was a bully. He was always beating up on people. He picked a fight with the captain of the football team. He was a real bully. He made a spike in welding class and put it under the church, the, the bus tire, so that it would have a flat. That's kind of a person he was. So we're on the school bus. He said, hey, everybody, we've got a preacher on the bus. We want him to preach for us. He didn't think I'd do it. He didn't know about the Holy Ghost. He didn't know I'd been filled with the Holy Ghost in boldness. Not the little bashful shy boy I used to be because the Holy Ghost had gotten a hold of me. And oh, they were laughing and they were joking. They were cursing. They were saying all sorts of things. I was in the front seat. I turned around, put my knees on the seat and used the seat for a pulpit. I can't tell you everything I said, but I think I talked about everything I knew to talk about in the Bible from heaven to hell and your soul being lost and needing to be saved. I didn't know who I was affecting, but it got so quiet you could have heard a pin drop. But the next day, the bus driver came down the hall. He said, I want to tell you I gave my heart to Jesus last night I got saved last night you never know who you're going to impact you never know who you're going to affect you stand up for Jesus stand up in the face of the devil stand up in the face of bullies and say though all hell is tell me I shall not be moved would you stand with me please all over the church hallelujah I didn't fall out of church there's nothing out there for me. I see the drunkards. I see the dope heads. I see people dying prematurely. I see the wrecked homes, the wrecked marriages. I see the destruction that it brings. Take this whole world, but give me Jesus. I'd rather have an old time religion than anything I know. I'd rather have a communion and fellowship with Jesus Christ than anything this world affords today. While the heads are bowed just a moment, the saints are praying. Hallelujah, hallelujah. A young man named Eutychus fell out of church. I don't want to tell you something else. Not only are young people falling out of church, but there's so many older folks that are falling out of church. This is too critical an hour to be forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. The Lord's coming. The signs of his coming are everywhere. And this world's going to pass away all the fashions, the fads, all the monetary things, all the materialism, it's all gonna pass away. But you've got an eternal soul. And you're gonna spend eternity somewhere. But you have to decide. If you come to Jesus Christ, he will in no wise cast you out. In him there's life, an abundant life. But if you follow the devil and his crowd, You'll end up in hell where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. The regrets for all eternity. Why did I fall out of church? Why didn't I listen? Why didn't I stay at the foot of the cross? Why didn't I stay close to Jesus? Why didn't I live for him? The answer, the key, the difference maker falling in love with Jesus Christ I don't think you can fall in love with the church until you fall in love with Jesus you can't live this life unless you love him with all your heart mind, soul and strength you cannot be a part time Christian you can't live for him just when it's convenient but you've got to give your heart soul and mind strength to him all I have, all I am, I give it to Jesus. Let me ask you this morning. While the heads are continued bound, the eyes are closed, the saints are praying. Will you make that commitment today? Would you come to him? I, I guarantee you, I promise you. Once you come to Jesus and meet him, you'll be like the Queen of Sheba. The half have not been told me. 
You'll be like the woman at the well who said, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. You'll be like Mary wanting to sit at his feet or Zacchaeus wanting to climb a tree just to see. You'll want to be like John who was always leaning up against him because he makes that much of a difference. He'll make a difference in your life. Young people, you need him. You're in the midst of wolves, but oh, he'll make you bold as a lion. He'll give you the boldness and the strength. He'll teach you what to say in that hour. I got ridiculed, I got mocked, I got bullied, but oh, I'm still standing. I'm here today. Through it all, I learned to trust in Jesus. Through it all, I learned to trust in him. Would you come today? Would you come and make a commitment to him? And say, Lord, I've decided to follow you. I've decided to live for you, to give you my all and my everything. Do we have any young people here today? who say, Pastor, I'm coming today just to show you and everyone else that I'm not going to fall out of church, that I'm going to continue to stay in love with Jesus Christ. I'm going to love him. I'm going to love his church and love his people because he's coming back for his church. Would you come today, young people? Do we have any young people who will come to the altar? Young people today who will come and say, I'm not going to fall out. I'm going to fall in love with Jesus. I'm not going to allow the enemy to steal me away. I'm not going to follow a multitude to do evil. But I'm going to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow him. Maybe there's some parents today you want to come and pray for your child. Maybe they're not even here today. You want to come and pray for them. But they won't be lost. You've tried to do everything you know to do. And you, you don't know what else to do. But give them to Jesus. Give them to the Lord. He'll not leave them alone. He'll not let them go. Just keep praying. Whatever it takes, Lord, save my family. Save my family. Come on today. Is there anybody else who just wants to make a personal commitment? And say, Lord, I want to love you like I've never loved you. I want to live for you like I never lived for you. While they sing, let the Spirit of God touch you and bless you today. I don't claim to be a And I don't have all the answers. But I have till the Not because I'm good, not because I'm great, not because I'm strong, I just know. You ask me how it is I'm still standing. You wonder how I made it through. Special power. There is no secret. I just and I held till the storm is over. I don't claim to be here, and I don't have all the answers, but I held. Not because I'm good, not because I'm good, not because I'm strong, I just don't. In my head, till the storm is over, I don't claim to be a hero, and I Not because I'm sure I just I can tell the things from